Good morning. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church on a beautiful, beautiful, sunshiny spring morning. Nobody's thinking about anything this morning except worship. Certainly not about anything that happened with a round orange ball yesterday, right? Some of you are worshiping at home because you couldn't bring yourself to get up this morning and come in and face another day. No, uh, we, we are delighted to be here this morning. You've chosen to be here in this space, and that means something. You've chosen to be a part of this community, whether you're a member, whether you're a visitor, whether you're, you've come along with someone else. We're delighted that you are here with us this morning to worship and to grow in, uh, in community. And so uh, there are a few things that I want to bring to your attention while you're here uh, that are coming up in the life of our church. Uh, first, we have another cello recital uh, coming up. It is this evening, and uh, Owen Chen, and some of you I know came to uh, the, the first recital a few weeks ago. Owen's got another recital, and I'm trying to, to see on the slide back three there that it's, uh, say again? Three o'clock. It's at three o'clock, thank you. It's at three o'clock here in this space. He really is a very, very, very gifted uh, cellist and, and would invite you to come out. What I tell our, our youth all the time when we have concerts or recitals and, and stuff that may not be up their alley is good music is good music regardless of whether it's your style and this is good music and so would invite you to come out today at three o'clock in this space and, uh, and listen to some good music. Uh, also uh, Holy Week is right around the corner and uh, we just want to make sure you know where you're supposed to be and when you're supposed to be there. So next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We'll have our, our normal two services with our, our Palm Parade and would certainly invite you to come out and participate in worship. Then we have our Maundy Thursday service at 6.30 uh, that Thursday, again, in this space. The following day we'll have a noon Good Friday service and we will begin in this space at noon 
but we will also be moving. This is going to be kind of a different, different type of service. Uh, I'm hoping that if all goes well, that it will be a very meaningful service as well. Uh, I know that's right in the midst of the workday for some, but if you are able to make it out for that Good Friday service, uh, I, I feel confident to say that it will be worth your while, uh, and we would certainly love to see you there. And then on Easter Sunday, uh, we have our normal two services at, at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock here uh, in this space. We also have our uh, what has certainly become our traditional uh, 6.30 sunrise service at the home of Mark and Bev Hill over on Kemp Road East. Uh, please do make a note of that address, and if you have questions about where that might be and uh, what, what you do, if you've never been to that service, uh, please do uh, ask. Uh, you can contact the office, and we'll get you information that you need, but uh, I, that's probably my favorite service of the year. Um, anyway, that's what's happening uh, coming up uh, for Holy Week and Easter. Uh, also, what's coming up is our mission auction. We're in the midst of this Lent challenge and, and, and Lenten season, and beyond that, we will continue uh, with the challenge for our, our mission, mission ministries, both here locally and uh, in our wider world. And the mission auction will kind of be the culmination of that. That's on April 13th. If uh, you were planning on making a donation, please do so today, because today is the deadline for our donations so that we can begin to tell you about what, uh, what we're going to be auctioning off, and, and, and you can really get ramped up and ready for that. Uh, we, we do have uh, small things. We have large things. We have vacation homes. We have uh, dinner experiences. Uh, we, we have all sorts of, of, of things that, that you can um, gift to other people. Maybe there's a, you have a favorite pastor who's going to be retiring soon, and you wanted to get him a little something before he leaves in June. Um, this is, this is going to be a fun night. Dinner will be uh, served, and, and it will be great fellowship, and, and hopefully we'll raise a lot of money for our, our mission ministry here at Westminster. Again, there's much more information about that on the website. And there's much more information about uh, the transition that we are in the midst of, and we'll soon be uh, getting deeper into uh, in the coming weeks and months. There'll be a short informational time following the worship service today about our pastoral transition and our trans from our transition team, and then there'll be a Q&A session down in the fellowship hall between services today that we would love for you uh, to participate in. And now let's continue to prepare our hearts for worship. Toward the end of Jesus' ministry, some Greeks came and asked two of his disciples, Andrew and Philip, um, they would like to see Jesus. Jesus says that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, but this is going to be a strange glory. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself, and he's referring to his crucifixion, when he will be lifted up on a cross, but also to his resurrection, when he'll be lifted up from death to new life. Jesus drew all kinds of people to his ministry, drawing not boundaries about who was invited into God's love. And now in his death and resurrection, Jesus says he will draw all people to him. Jesus invites each one of us into the strange glory of God's new creation. Friends, as you are able and as you desire, let's stand and sing together. When we fall into our knees, when we've broken everything, we're waiting on, we're waiting on you, God. Open up the heavens wide, put a new song in. Dead is raised again in 
You may be seated. Friends, will you join me in our opening prayer this morning? Welcoming God, you lift us up and offer each one of us a life-changing love that leaves no one out. Sometimes our hearts feel so heavy that we struggle to rise up and claim this new life. In this moment of quiet, we lift up to the those things we'd like to give up for good, for the sake of the good. Amen. In Psalm 51, we find words that we can use as our own prayer. The psalmist says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. My friends, God hears our prayers for mercy and God answers us. God comes in love and lifts us up into new life. So hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Slave to 
seated. I'd like to invite the children to join me on the chancel steps. Is everyone this morning? Thumbs up. I like it. Two thumbs up. What do you think it means to lift someone up? If they're sad, to make them happy. What else? Make them feel better. Make them feel better. Yeah. To encourage them. Anyone else? Those are all really, really good things. And when someone's down, depending on why they're down, it's always nice to be that person that's there to say, it's going to be okay. Which reminded me of my dad. And my dad used to work with people who had lost their jobs. And he had this special little saying that he used to say to everyone. And he would give them a pen. And it said, egg bar. And people would say, what in the world does that mean? What do you think that means? I'm going to say it like him. Everything going to be all right. And that's what that pen meant. So he would give that to people to lift them up. So today's worship theme is all about lifting people up to new heights. And if you remember last week, I kept thinking to myself, oh, what a dreadful story when Carl's house was on fire and he had given Kevin the mama bird up for... Um, to be caught by mean old months, I thought, oh, what a horrible thing. And then I thought, oh, there's got to be something good next, next week. So here's where we are this week in our book. And it's the last week for anyone who's asking. Um, Carl, Carl made it to Paradise Falls, but he felt lonely in his empty house. So with, with Russell and Doug's help, Carl went back to rescue Kevin. But this time, Carl could not save his house. It fell down, down, down. That does not sound like it's so uplifting, does it? But this time, oh, but that was okay. Carl might have lost his house, but he still had his memories of Ellie, and he also had his friends. So the, the end of the story, he's lifted up because 
not only did he lost his house, and that was his favorite thing that reminded him of Ellie, but then he remembered that he carried Ellie in his heart, and he had all these friends on the journey with him. And our church likes to lift people up. If I were to tell you or challenge you this week to go out and lift people up, what might you do? Right. If, if they're really down and there's someone that doesn't have anyone to play with at recess, you could be the person that goes up and lifts them up that day, right? That's a great idea. Anyone else? Will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, give us the heart to lift up family, friends, and enemies. We love you and want to share your love with others. Amen. You can go back to your seats. I'm going to believe that you are up to something good. I'm going to believe that you are up to something good when I can understand the things that happen in my life. I'm going to believe that you are up to something good. A reading from the Gospel of John. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the Passover feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus said, listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me the Father will honor. Right now, I am shaken. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this? No, this is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, glorify your name. A voice came out of the sky. I have glorified it and I'll glorify it again. The listening crowd said, it was thunder. Others said, an angel spoke to him. Jesus said, the voice didn't come for me, but for you. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. Voices from the crowd answered, We heard from God's law that the Messiah lasts forever. How can it be necessary, as you put it, that the Son of Man be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Jesus said, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. 
If you walk in the darkness, you don't know where you're going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. This is the word of the Lord. Let's get a look to God in prayer. God, as we hear these words of Scripture, as we turn to the words of the sermon, we pray that you would quiet any voice in us but your own, so that in these words we might hear your word speaking to us this day. We pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. That seems like a radical kind of statement to make. I will draw all people to myself. I think what makes it even more surprising is Jesus is not talking about being lifted up on a throne. Jesus is talking about being lifted up on the cross, about being crucified, dead, and buried. It's a radical statement, but I think it's also good news. In a world that seems to be falling apart, in a world where there doesn't seem to be much that can hold us together, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And so I want to think about what Jesus means here, and I want to think about what it means for us to follow a crucified and risen Lord who draws all people to himself. The story starts here when some Greeks show up in Jerusalem to worship alongside the Jews at the Passover feast. And they find Philip and they ask Philip, uh, we want to see Jesus. Just for this lesson, Jesus has also come to Jerusalem. And you'll remember that story, that the crowds gather around Jesus. They, they cut palm, le- palm leaves and they begin to wave them. They, they greet you like, Jesus like a, a conquering hero. They cry out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, the King of Israel. We'll celebrate that next week at Palm Sunday. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are also watching all of this, and, and they just kind of shake their heads and say, you see, we can do nothing. The whole world has gone after him. And then in our lesson, as if to, to fulfill those words of the Pharisees, these Greeks come, these, these Gentiles, these, these outsiders, and they say, we want to see Jesus. The irony here is that the religious leaders can't really see Jesus. They can't really understand what is going on. And the outsiders, the Gentiles, the Greeks are drawn to him and say, we want to see Jesus. Being able to see clearly is a big theme in John's gospel. It's, it's something that's important to Jesus. It's something that's important to us. Can, can we really see? Can we see what is going on? Robert Barron says Christianity is above all a way of seeing. Everything else in the Christian life revolves and circles around this transformation of visions. Christians see the world differently. And so their prayer, their action, their their way of being in the world looks different from other people. Uh, Barron goes on to say that, that he thinks that the basic problem we have in life is that we tend to see from a mind of fear rather than a mind of trust. And and, and once we have that lens, once we see the world through this lens of fear, it begins to feel like a hostile world around us. We begin to feel like we are being threatened. And so there's this tendency to to, to be ready to defend ourselves and, and to lash out at those who we think are our enemies. And I think that's what's happening to the the Pharisees here, to the religious leaders. Uh, They're living through this kind of lens of fear, this mind of fear. And so they see Jesus as a threat. They're afraid they're going to lose their authority. They're afraid they lose their positions of respect. And so they see Jesus as an enemy. And they try to protect themselves by, by getting rid of him, even by killing him. I think it's also what happens to Pontius Pilate, the the Roman governor. 
He lives with this fear that the people are going to rise up against him, that Jesus will institute this kind of revolution. He's afraid that the emperor will find that he's too weak. And so Pilate is willing to send an innocent man to the cross. And I think sometimes it happens to us. I think sometimes we begin to see this world through this this mind of fear instead of through a mind of trust. And so it, it clouds our vision. It brings out the worst in us. I think that's why we gather week after week for worship. We come to this place because we want to see Jesus. We want to understand who he is and and what he's doing in the world and what he's doing in our lives. We want to see ourselves more clearly. We want to see the world more clearly. We want our, our spiritual blindness to be healed. And so we come here to see Jesus. The, the Greeks come and they say, we want to see Jesus. And Jesus' response is, the hour has come for me to be glorified. But it's going to be a strange glory. It's going to be the glory of the cross. I think Jesus knows that that people can't really see him. People can't really understand him unless they understand this strange glory of the cross that Jesus has come to offer up his life. And so Jesus starts now to talk to his disciples about his death and about his resurrection. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and is buried... It just remains a single grain. But if it's buried, then it bears much fruit. Uh, We've got these bulbs of flowers that that, that lie underneath the ground in our yard all winter long. And and now this time of year, these flowers just start to bloom out from everywhere. And Jesus says that's what his death is going to be like, that, that when he dies, it will bear this beautiful fruit. But first, Jesus has to be willing to give up his life. To trust that God is in control of his life, even when he gives it up. He has to be willing to to live with his trust. And that's what's going to lead him to the cross. Uh, We read Eugene Peterson's translation of, of those verses. Peterson says, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. And I think that's part of what the cross shows us, that that, that we have to have this kind of death, this this kind of letting go, this kind of reckless love. And only then can we be lifted up and receive new life. But I think the cross is also about something more. It's also about the way God is at work in the world to redeem and to heal the world's brokenness. Uh, I shared a quote in the e-news this week from Christopher Watkin. Uh, He says, the cross is an oddly provocative choice for the central image of a new religion, hoping to get off the ground in Palestine. Remember the cross in Jesus' day was not a sign of love. It was a sign of Roman power, Roman brutality. Uh, The cross for for Rome was not just a way to to execute their criminals. It was kind of a public spectacle that was meant to send this message to everyone. If you cross Rome, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, It it was based on this system of vengeance, this this way of saying, if if you hurt me, I'm going to do something even worse to you. It's based on fear, on violence, on on oppression, on, on control of others. And it's not just Rome that, that, that has this kind of system. This, this becomes kind of the default operating system for most of human history. And so you just see this, there's always one group that, that tries to, to be in control and oppresses the other group and, and uses fear and violence to do that. And then that group, the oppressed, will rise up and try to get rid of their oppressors and then they become the new oppressors. Nietzsche once said, beware when you fight a monster, lest you become a monster yourself. And I think we human beings just create a lot of monsters. And we sometimes become a monster. Even if we're always claiming it's, it's the other folks who are. 
we get trapped in these systems that, that, that just cycle and create even more violence and, and evil. You see that if you look at the news around us. But what Jesus does is, is to step out of that system and to bring a judgment on that system. Jesus refuses to retaliate. He refuses to start a revolution. He refuses to return evil for evil. And that means Jesus ends up going to the cross. And it, and it looks to most folks like, like this is a sign of weakness, like this is a kind of defeat. But it becomes a, a new kind of strength. Not strength based on fear, but, but strength based on love. And then there's this surprise ending. That after Jesus dies, he, he rises again on the third day and shows that there is this other power at work in the world. There is this light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And so Jesus says, when, when I am lifted up on the cross and then to the resurrection, I will draw all people to myself. This is what God is doing in the world trying to redeem and reconcile and, and bring all things together. And Jesus' death and resurrection show us this, this different way of seeing the world, this different way of seeing God. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1.9, God has made known to us the mystery of his will that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather all things in him things in heaven and on earth. I think this is also what's happening in the church, at least when we get it right. That God is at work in the church to draw people together. So the church becomes a place where there's neither Jew or Gentile, where there's not slave or free, where there's not male and female, but, but all become one in Christ. We don't always get that right. But I think that's where God is leading us. And that's what God is doing in Jesus Christ. That's why our church's vision statement is to participate in God's work through Christ. To redeem and reconcile and heal all things. And I think we do that by celebrating God's grace wherever we find it. We do that by following Jesus wherever Jesus leads us. We do that by healing the world whenever we have opportunities. Now the crowd hears all this and the crowd is a little bit confused. And we may hear it and we may be a little bit confused too. And I think that's okay. Jesus just says, while you have the light, walk in the light. And you'll become children of light. I think Jesus is just saying to them, I'm here and I'm the light that you can see clearly through. So just believe in the light. Walk in the light. Then you'll become children of God. And I think that's the invitation for us as well. Jesus is this light that shines in the world. And we just trust that light. And try to walk in the light. And then we'll be lifted up. We'll get this life, that this real life, that is eternal life. Let's look to God in prayer. God, there is a lot of darkness in this world. And sometimes it seems like the darkness is overtaking us. God, help us to see your light. Help us to see your love. Help us to walk in that light and become children of light for the sake of the world. Amen. I think one of the great questions that we have as people of faith uh, so often is, is uh, I know I can come to church on Sunday mornings and worship and I can go to faith form formation and grow in my understanding of who God is, but how, how can I lift up those around me? We have an opportunity, it's, it's just a part of a larger opportunity, but we have an opportunity each week when we gather 
during this time in our worship service to, to give back out of that with which we've been blessed so that, so that our gifts and our thanksgiving can go to lifting up and sharing the light with those in our wider community. And so this morning as the Spirit leads you, I would encourage you and invite you to share your love and to share your light through the gifts of your tithes and offerings. I watched the basement flood and the foundation crack. I saw the walls come down past the point of being built back. I heard the storm roll in like a freight train in the night. Found shelter in the shadows. Will this ever be all right? Where do I live? As we head into a, a time of uh, prayer, I want to bring a, just a couple things to your attention, and then I'll ask if you have any celebrations or concerns to share with us. Uh, we learned uh, shortly after worship last Sunday uh, of the passing of Rick Benton. Uh Rick is a longtime member of our congregation, certainly a fixture in our choir and in many other places, and uh, just quite a character. And uh, Rick passed away uh, doing something he loved, doing a triathlon. Uh, but it was certainly very, very unexpected and, and uh, a gut punch for many, many people. Uh, so certainly uh, hold uh, Jenny, his wife, and their children in, uh, in your prayers this week as they grieve that great loss. There will be a service for Rick on April 6th at 2 o'clock in this space, so make note of that. Uh, and also I want to celebrate, yesterday we had our spring thing for our, our young people and some young families, and we had quite a, a cluster of kids out in the talent field uh, collecting 
uh, Easter eggs and, and, and storing up their candy uh, and playing games, and, and what a gorgeous day it was. Uh, and somebody, I'm not going to mention any names, forgot to put on sunscreen uh, and stood out there for quite some time soaking in those rays. Uh, so, uh, again, concerns and celebrations uh, abound in our lives, but we lift them all up to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Are there other ways that we can join with you in prayer this week? That's right. Wilson Davis lost his sister. She was 91, I believe, uh, uh, this week. And so we lift up Wilson and his family. Lord, in your mercy. Other things. Let's go to God in prayer. Great big God, you are mighty and mysterious and great enough to gather all your creation to you. Great enough to lift us up out of our despair and darkness. Great enough to open our eyes. Great enough to love us all. Great enough to give us life. Great enough to extend grace and mercy when we struggle and when we just don't understand the world or your ways. Lord, our God, as we sit in quietness, our thoughts are far from quiet. We're wrestling with doubts and fears. We're looking for answers. We're hoping against hope. We're seeking strength. We are hungry. We're hungry for warm sunshine, for healed bodies, for rest from tears. Your word says the hungry will be filled, and we ask today for you to fill us. Fill us up with the breath of life. Fill us up with thankful hearts. Fill us up with calmness, courage, and most of all, with the knowledge of your presence. There are people we know and love who are sick and suffering. We ask, God, that you would surround them with your strong healing presence. Grant wisdom to those who need answers to difficult questions. Grant hope to those who are living with hurt. And friendship to those who feel lonely. Most of all, Lord God, may we know your love, your great love that you have for each one of us. You know the hairs on our heads, you count each beat of our heart. You knit us together when we were being formed, you know our getting up and our lying down, you're familiar with all our ways. There's no place we can hide from you. You were there at our beginning and you will be with us through to the end. May we not lose sight of your constant care. We look to you, O God, to be present in our communities and in our world. Continue to show us how Westminster can be a part of your work in the world. Teach us how we can grow into faith and become more and more like Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the work of our hands and the words from our mouths. Bless all that we offer and receive today. We gather all our prayers together, the spoken and the unspoken, as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Let me remind you that we will have about a five-minute informational meeting right after this worship service, then downstairs in the fellowship hall a chance to ask more questions, and this is about the transition that comes after my retirement in June. So go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold fast to that which is good, return to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help those who are suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of God our Father, the love of His Son Jesus Christ, and the power of God's Spirit be with you now and always. Take up the cross and follow Jesus. Take up the cross every day. Lift up your voices and say that we know Him. Tell the cross and take up the cross and follow. Good morning. Um, let's go to the Lord and just a quick prayer. Lord, I invite you into this space with us as we share in our gratitude and gratefulness for Ernie and his leadership and his transition into the next phase of his life and for your guidance and discernment as our congregation seeks our next leadership. Amen. So, I'm, do y'all have the slides? Thank you. So we just wanted to take a minute as the transition team. And first, let me introduce any that are here, if you'll just stand or wave. So our transition team is myself as the chair, Derek Gracie, Stephanie Keeney, Larry Hooker, Melanie Woodard, Gary Cram, and Bert Andia. So names that I think people are very familiar with. So as far as the transition, um, there is a defined process. It's governed by our Presbytery and the PCUSA. And it started with Ernie's announcement of his intent to retire, which was February 10th. The transition team was then formed and approved by the session as of February 25th. And we started our process at that time. At this point in time, we are finalizing the job description. This will allow us to share it out with interested parties. We're getting passive um, interest. We may also do some intentional solicitation. Um, and once we get through that process, we'll interview and then we'll take the recommendation to session to get to our transitional pastor. Next, once we have the um, transitional pastor on board, working with us, we're also working on the mission study. This includes the church pri profile, our history, and where we're looking to go over the next five years. The congregation will be participating and giving input on that. The presbytery will approve the mission study. Upon that approval, we will then move into electing the pastor nominating committee. That committee will serve for about nine to 12 months there's a lot of discernment, confidentiality, 
as they go through that process to recommend our new pastor. And then as that process comes to the finalization, the presbytery will approve the call for the new pastor. Us as a congregation will vote. And then we will install our next pastor. So high level, that's the process that we'll be going through. We'll continue to provide updates. Our intention is to be very transparent through this process. We invite you to direct questions to the committee. You can target myself or Larry primarily, and we will get answers back to you. So now we'll go downstairs to the fellowship hall, and we're open to further questions and 